Good morning, everybody. Uh, we wanted to kick off uh, our opening uh, presentation and panel discussion this morning. I entitled Border to Border Broadband, Making Access to High-Speed Internet a Priority in Minnesota. You can tell the folks who are serious about policy and cutting edge 21st century policy when they show up at 7.30 on the first day of, uh, of NCSL. So thrilled that we were able to add this to the, uh, to the agenda today. I think this is going to shed a lot of light on what Minnesota has been able to do in the last couple of years uh, in advancing uh, investments in broadband uh, technology. Should first and foremost introduce myself. I'm State Senator Matt Schmidt, and uh, again, I want to welcome you to this this great panel discussion we have in, in, in place for us. Before I say anything else, I just want to recognize that this session is hosted by three committees at NCSL: the Communications, Financial Services, and Interstate Commerce Committee, the Budget and Revenue Committee, and also the Labor and Economic Development Committee. And uh, I'd also like to make sure that we thank uh, Thomson Reuters for sponsoring today's uh, panel discussion and breakfast. Without your help and sponsorship, we probably wouldn't be here having this conversation today. So thank you very much, Thompson Reuters. And I'd also like to remind folks that uh, uh, video and audio recording of the session is prohibited without our NCSL uh, permission. I should tell you that uh, the state senate of Minnesota has that uh, uh, approval. We are filming this session, and it's going to be available on YouTube <coughs> after the fact, so you can share with your colleagues or review if you'd like. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to set this uh, stage for our conversation this morning. Uh, just by saying what Minnesota has set out to do here in the last few years. And in state statute, we have set goals to ensure by 2015 that all Minnesota residents will have access to high-speed broadband and that the state be a leader nationally and globally for broadband utilization. Now, our distinguished and rarely seen together panel of experts will discuss Minnesota's broadband development efforts, including legislative and policy initiatives to accelerate ex uh, achieving these goals. So I have to tell you, it's no small coup to get them all here on the same panel. I know we're all friendly and, 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 and do good work in broadband, but to have us all here today, it, it's a, quite a treat. Now we have a few minutes for questions at the end of each speaker's presentation, and time for more general questions toward the end of the, the discussion this morning. We hope that you will walk out of here with useful, tan, tangible information uh, that will be useful for your similar efforts in your own states. And if you're from Minnesota, and this last session was a blur, hopefully this will add a little bit more context and, and specificity to what we were doing here this past session in the broadband uh, arena. And I guess uh, before I turn it over to our speakers, and I'll do that very, very quickly here, because uh, they have very interesting things to say and folks have heard me talk enough about this issue. I just want to say that Minnesota spent a lot of time in the last 10 years talking about broadband. And we've had uh, uh, three different governor's task forces on broadband. We've had a number of communities do really good work in, in bring together a variety of stakeholders to talk about the topic. We've had philanthropic uh, activity, Blandon Foundation, among others. And we've, we've had uh, a number of communities have community-based discussions. We put state speed goals in, into order. But one thing that we haven't really done here is, is create a, uh, this an infrastructure fund or incentives to, to promote uh, broadband expansion and the development of, of infrastructure networks around the state. Uh, this past year with our border-to-border -border broadband fund, we were able to do that, and we're hoping that it's going to make the difference in making sure that Minnesota meets its state speed goals by 2015. Now, our panel can talk a lot about where those speed goals came from, uh, what they mean, and how we're going to get there. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to kick into that. So in the interest of time, I'm, not going, I'm going to read our, uh, our, bio, our bios from our, our speakers uh, in, in short. First up, we have Margaret Anderson Kelleher, who is the president and CEO of the Minnesota High Tech Association. Together with 350 member companies and organizations, Margaret works to make Minnesota one of the country's top five technology states. Prior to MTHA, Minnesota, uh, Margaret served in the Minnesota legislature, including two terms as Speaker of the House. As House Speaker, she guided passage of a nation-leading renewable energy standard, built a broad coalition to enact Minnesota's first comprehensive transportation funding bill in 20 years, and championed Minnesota's angel investment tax credit. She currently chairs Minnesota, Minnesota Governor Dayton's Broadband Task Force. Without further ado, Margaret. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. I can tell that people are already having a very good time in Minnesota because those 50 people who told me at the reception last night they'd be here, you know, only about 10 of you are here. So um, hopefully we'll have a few more come into the room. So I, I want to make sure that I first of all acknowledge the people in the room who have worked on this issue. You can assume that everyone up here has worked on this issue. But if you have worked on the broadband issue, voted for, served on the task forces, either current or past, will you raise your hand in this room? So legislators who were voting and staff members, and thank you. So I'm gonna kick right into um, a few of the things that I was asked to talk about today 
are issues around where we stand today, the work of the task force, and a little bit more in depth of how we got to where we are in terms of getting things done, which I think is particularly important. I also served on the NCSL Executive Committee, and so I know that it's also important to be able to take things out of these sessions that you might be able to replicate. So right now, in Minnesota, 385,000 Minnesotans do not have access to high-speed broadband connection at their home at our state goals. And I think that uh, Dan is going to be talking about state goal speed, I hope, in her presentation a little bit, so that you can have that context. And I will probably talk a little bit about it as well. So what does it mean? It means that uh, it's a little longer for people to be able, and very frustrating, for people to be able to connect to the things that they need through the internet. It can be everything from the things they do for enjoyment to the very serious things, like being able to fill out the FAFSA for a family who has a student going to college. You do that now mostly online. You also may not be able to file your taxes. Uh, through an online mechanism if you don't have connection to high-speed broadband. And yes, even things like LinkedIn as you're looking for a job or Facebook as you're keeping up with your family. These things all do not happen at the speed or may not happen at all if you are not connected in a way. What does it mean further? It means that we have issues uh, when you're not connected for things like workforce retention, the ability to maybe work at home one day a week, the ability to work at home when you live in a rural area is not as possible if you don't have this connection. It stifles economic growth. We do know that families that have high speed internet connection, so this would be above our state goals of 10 megabits down and five megabits up. When it is above that, they have incomes that raise about $2,000 a year. It makes an economic difference to have high-speed connection across this country and across the state. It's also really important in education modernization. I also wear another hat. I have lots of hats I wear. I serve as a trustee of the state college and university system. As we have worked to put more of our coursework online and have hybrid classes, where most of it's done online, but then there's an in-person uh, piece as well, you have a very difficult time participating in those things when you don't have high-speed connection. And then, of course, access to healthcare services. We are seeing some great development of applications around the state of Minnesota and around the country that use high-speed broadband to communicate information, images, uh, diagnostics, but if you are not connected in this way, this is a challenging thing. So, like I said, our speed, uh, our speed goals passed in law in 2010, 10 megabits download, 5 megabits upload. Some of you might even think who are in the industry or know this well, well, that's not even all that fast. But that was groundbreaking in 2010, to put a state speed goal in the law to be able to move forward. And, of course, this is critical for being able to move our state into the top five technology states in the country. We cannot get there without this sort of connection. So the state has been playing a very crucial role in being able to move this issue forward. Um, so let me get there. Um, first of all, uh, there have been three task forces. Rick was actually the chair of the first task force. Uh, 2009, right? <coughs> eight, eight, nine. And uh, our task force, we are very clear. We actually used the work of that task force to build our first plan going forward, starting in 2011, 2010, 2011. The state also has a critical role in mapping and collecting <coughs> data. Some of your states may have been affiliated with the Connected Nation project which did mapping and collecting of data. We were here in Minnesota even before we had the, the Office of Broadband. This is something legislators find valuable and have said they want to have continue going forward. We actually established here in Minnesota one of the first things of the task force 
was to say, we need an office of broadband development. We need somewhere for the work to live. We need somewhere for someone to get the work done. Because up to that point, the task force was really largely, we are all volunteers. And so although we come together once a month, you know how that goes, continued work, follow-up research. So organizations like MHTA, Thomson Reuters, generously volunteered staff to staff these things up until the point that we were able to have the Office of Broadband Development. Then, we also, this past year, had a big, bold idea, and that was to have an infrastructure fund. So, Last year, we established the Office of Broadband. It had some funding. We were able to hire an excellent executive director, who we got from our task force, actually. Uh, and we really <coughs> feel that Dan and Mackenzie is the right person to lead this work. But after that, we said, now we need to have some, some money in the pool to be able to get things going, to build public-private partnerships. So we proposed, we had a surplus last year, that's important for other legislators to know. We had a surplus for the first time in a long time, and we took advantage of that to propose a $100 million broadband border-to-border -border fund that would be matched at least one-to-one -one in public-private partnerships. We were successful working with the legislature and the governor in securing $20 million. That program, Dan will probably talk a little more about detail of that, is being uh, established right now and grants will be made by the end of the year. We think that this is an important thing going forward as a real breakthrough to build, uh, build the work. Convening the stakeholders, obviously important. I've talked about that a little bit uh, more. We also think our role has been to inform both policymakers and the public. Just last week, I did a segment on Minnesota Public Radio. Um, it's always really hard to not have those turn into people who call in and say, you know, my parents live five miles south of Duluth and they don't have a good connection, what should I do? Um, but we had a good discussion with Minnesotans calling in and here's what I'd say, not one single person called in in an hour and said, I don't know why we need this. I don't think we need this. This is a bad idea. Everyone was calling in and saying, I want better connection. I want more connection. I want faster connection. And so I think that that's a really important piece of hearing from the public. We take our meetings around the state. Other groups, Senator Schmidt has actually been doing hearings around the state. This is just all a way to build public awareness, both of the need for connectivity and the need for what you can do with broadband when you have it. That's an important piece as well. Obviously, setting goals is an important part of what the state has been helpful in doing through the legislative process, and then partnering with providers, communities, and the federal government. That's one of the things that we saw early on the task force that we needed to have outreach, better outreach to the federal government. There are monies available out there for through healthcare dollars, uh, through public safety dollars to be able to build on this. So I just wanna briefly take you through the task force. I did not do the list of the task force, but members, the important part of a governor's task force or a legislative task force, or even if you're doing a community-based task force, Members are, there's members of industry on the task force. Paul Wirtz is in the audience from AT&T. He is on the task force with us. We work on the consensus model in what we propose. So we work through the hard work in the task force so policymakers know that we largely agree on what they are seeing as a recommendation. We provide these recommendations to ensure that businesses and residents have ubiquitous high-speed access across the state. We are responsible for developing the action plan. We do a report yearly to the governor, and of course we take the opportunity to send that to every legislator in the state as well, and to work on correcting disparities. The goal is to ensure that everyone in the state of Minnesota has access to technology and information resources that they need to work, live, and enjoy life in Minnesota. So you can actually get the task force list. I just want to say, if you write down the first part of this address, or we're going to post this online, the DEED, Department of Employment and Economic Development, which is the home of where the Office of Broadband Development lives, 
has a great web page with all of our reports, all of the information, all the task force members on it. So, one of the big things I was charged with in this presentation, uh, maybe because of my, my past of being a legislator, uh, was to point out some tips about how to advance technology-heavy legislation in the legislature and with the administration. And so these are from my perspective. It's probably not exhaustive, but I have nine items for you today that uh, I'd like you to, to just tune into for a few minutes. So first of all, the critical part is finding champions, finding champions like Rick King, finding champions, legislative champions like Senator Schmidt and Representative Simonson in the House who really led the way on the issue in Minnesota finding other champions who would show up along the way, who were so articulate as citizens about what they needed to have in connection. So finding those champions. Um, of course, keeping, and some of these things are so basic, but sometimes we don't think about them in the context of this issue. Keeping allies informed and close to the issue as it's moving forward. Before this issue, even when we we're doing the Office of Broadband, when we we're doing the fund this year, like every day there seemed to be things changing and moving. And, and there were rumors, of course, there's always rumors. Information is the, is the mother's milk of the legislative session. And so there's always something happening uh, with an issue. And so you always have to kind of keep the, the allies really informed as to what's what you know is real, what might be real, and what is just a spurious argument around along the way. I think also keeping uh, executive branch allies informed as well, because we all know that the legislature is doing its work, grinding in there, working on bills, and what happens is that uh, they they may not be as informed until the end. Keep it somewhat simple. People ask me this all the time. I testified nine times last year on the issue in the legislature. And legislators have a wide variety of understanding of the technology. So keeping a, a very basic presentation with the ability to follow up with detail is important. Building a bipartisan coalition, absolutely necessary to pass this sort of legislation. And in fact, we say this is not a partisan issue. This is something that Minnesotans want and so we have an obligation to keep it bipartisan. Use the why. This is probably the most important thing in technology-heavy legislation. <laughs> People do not want me to come and talk about megabits or how if it's fiber to the home or what the technology is. They want to know why is this important to their constituents. And if you can give that why fast and easy and good examples, that's going to go a long way. Have a good ground game. Have a ground game that includes multiple, multiple layers of folks. Think through implementation. Now this is one that I think in all legislative policy, I actually teach at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs as well, and I teach a course on implementation and policy design. And this is the thing that often we forget about when we're making policy. And so we thought about that ahead of time with the fund, and we kind of outlined some basic things that needed to be there. But you know, think through policy ahead of time when you're doing this. Use the technical jargon carefully. People get hooked on technical jargon, and it pulls them away from the why of doing something. And they can get very passionate and engaged around that. And then uh, keep the long haul view, and also, frankly, keep a sense of humor. So, here we go, future policy recommendations. You're probably wondering what, the, what, are, what are we going to say next. So uh, we have written a letter to the Commissioner of Deed and Department of Economic Development, where the office lives. And we said, um, for this office, we do two-year biennial budgeting here in Minnesota. Not everyone does out there. So two-year biennial budget. Uh, 2.9 for program delivery, running the office, continuing the mapping, and the data collection. We've said the need for full border-to-border -border build out in Minnesota is between $900 million and $3 billion. We do not expect the state of Minnesota to do that full amount. This is a public-private partnership. This is going to spur a lot of activity. But we do need some more seed funds to keep this going. 
So we have $20 million right now. We first asked for 100. We're recommending the commissioner at least 200 million. And I think we're fair to say we're probably not going to quite get there, but I think it's important to keep the need in front of the commissioner and the administration and lawmakers as we move forward. We also think a stopgap measure in Minnesota is a really excellent program of regional library telecommunications aid that exists already. This is often a place that people use as their stopgap connection and school telecommunications aid that helps people connect at another location. Um, we've heard stories of people sitting in the parking lot outside libraries around Minnesota, truck door open, doing uh, testing, proctoring for national tests, uh, being able to pirate the Wi-Fi off the library. This is a common experience for librarians. And so we want to make sure librarians and schools have the tools that they need to get us there. So I'd just like to thank you for, for your time today. Um, my contact information is on the screen. I'm also uh, in the presenter book, and, and a quick Google will find MHTA for you. So I'm going to stop, and I think we're a couple questions. All right. Any questions for uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher here? I could start with one, um, and Margaret, thank you so much for providing that great overview. I think you answered a lot of questions that folks may have had, and uh, if there are some questions out there, feel free to step up to the microphone. We do have a couple of mo moments. But just your, your unique perspective as former Speaker of the House, and, and now uh, you know, have a, having a different perspective you know, in industry, if you're able to comment a little bit about the difficulties of getting our arms around this issue as legislators, and uh, you can answer that however you like, as long or as, as short as you like. But this is not an easy issue for legislators to grapple with. And I think that's been one of the challenges for us. And I'm sure that's true in other states. Well, what do you think? I think that building champions is the important part. So having internal legislative champions, I saw Senator Thomas Sony come in the room. He chairs the committee that was instrumental in the Senate of being able to, to grant us those dollars. And when I think about the work that was done, you know, senator to senator, representative to representative, you know, I can, I can be, I get it. I'm behind a line now. There's a certain line I can no longer move over and talk to my former colleagues as easily. So I need to rely on former colleagues and new colleagues who are elected to be able to educate each other. And I think that's an important part of this that this is, is really, and then you identify where people have questions and can follow back around with more detailed information. Well, thank you. And we have a question here. Sir, if you could identify your, yourself and where you're from. Sure, Sandra Markmano from Wisconsin, and congratulations on the accomplishments that you made here. Uh, who are some of the important non-legislative uh, champions that you uh, worked with? Who are some of the allies, and where did you find uh, resistance? So um, first of all, I, I also want to say the administration, the governor, the commissioner were very supportive of what we were doing. Individual uh, staff members in the governor's office were very helpful in advancing the issue forward. But on the outside, I would say that uh, task force three, as we might call ourselves, the third task force. So there were two Governor Pawlenty task forces. This is Governor Dayton's task force. The important part was having industry at the table. So we have representation from community members, uh, folks who want community broadband, folks who are there because they have a boss to answer to with ROI. There's been a lot of education within the task force about what happens here. And so we've been able to overcome a lot in the sense that you know, one of the reasons people might wonder, well, why doesn't it work in some places? Why can't they just build this out? And it really has to do, and this is not a disparaging comment, but it is market failure in certain parts of the state. The way that uh, it works, and we've had open discussions about this with providers, to be able, the average build out to a home in Minnesota where the ROI is a positive ROI, somewhere around $2,000. We have parts of our state where it might take five, eight, ten thousand dollars to get to that home or farm site. And so being able to have a partnership, a public-private partnership, that helped a lot. Absolutely resistance in certain places. I mean, we have good and healthy debates over the word unserved and underserved in this state and what it means. 
I, you know, dreamt about it, I think, for about three weeks straight <laughs> during the legislative session, because we'd be just sort of all tense at each other. Because the unserved we count is people who don't even meet the basic federal speed, which is three and under one, I think, um, roughly. And then uh, those are the unserved people. And then the underserved people don't meet the state, state speed goal on one end of that, but maybe do have a current sitting incumbent provider that isn't providing. And so the question is who to focus on. And we right now have focused on the unserved first. But that was a big point of contention. Well, thank you for the question, and, and Margaret, thank you for your, your great perspective. We really appreciate that. Should just mention to folks, we, we expect to have some time at the end for general Q and A of all, all the panelists here. Our next speaker uh, is Rick King, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Technology at Thomson Reuters, where he has been since 2000. In 2011, Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton asked Rick to serve on the Governor's Technology Advisory Council. He also had chaired the Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty's Ultra High Speed Broadband Task Force, which we previously referenced. Uh, in 2012, Rick was named one of the 200 people to watch by Twin Cities Business and won the CIO Career Achievement Award from the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal. He was Minnesota High Tech Association's 2008 Technology Executive of the Year and one of Computer World 2007 Top 100 Leaders in IT. Again, without further ado, Rick. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. All right. Good. How many uh, are not from Minnesota? Okay, good. It's good to know what kind of jokes to tell. <laughs> uh, Canada. Canada jokes. Uh. Here we go. Um, I wanted to cover a few things. So first, uh, a little historical perspective, and then to talk about the goals themselves. And we'll get into some of the dynamics if you're thinking about doing something like that. Uh, Touching on a few points that uh, Margaret made and even in the uh, conversation, talk a little bit about what's changed and the great work that the, the current task force is doing and why this is so important, why we're involved. Our company is involved because of the things I'll say at the end, and that's one of the ways that companies should get involved. Um, it has a lot to do with your own competitiveness and also your employees. So. Um, Margaret talked about the task force. We were named in 2008 9. It was my first opportunity to get legislation passed, so I learned a lot in that. You're experts at that. I'm not, but it took a lot just to get a task force created by the governor. Um, I was asked to chair the task force, and it actually is this. Our, we were the seventh, they were the ninth. Now, she didn't know this, I don't think, because historically, we had six before us that did reports, they went on the shelf, and they began to keep the dust from the wood. So you might have some of that going on too. And a lot of the people that were asked to participate, not me in this case, uh, had been members of those previous ones, and actually said, well, what's going to be different about this one? How are we going to take our work and see if there's some fruit? They said, trust me, I have some different ideas about this. And then I said, what the hell am I going to do, really? Now, so that's, that, that I'll go through a little bit. Funding at this time was impossible. Um, there was just no chance. We would argue about it for the first couple of sessions that we met. And we met uh, once a month for a year and a half, and then twice a month, and three times a month, and at subcommittees and all that all around the state, same with uh, Margaret's task force now. Um, but the one thing that every single time I said, we'll not, we're not going to get funding, so let's not, let's not even bring that up. We can say we need that, but it's not the time. The one time money that was available this year was fantastic to get things started. Now we've got to see it get into the perpetual cycle. So money, money certainly was important. Um, so, you know, we had to pull the rabbit out of the hat on that one, I'm afraid. Um, now, what we were trying to think about was uh, driving the utilization here. Um, why is broadband important? Being able to articulate it to people, particularly the legislative folks, the staff, the media, to talk about things. And what we settled on in the report, which is pretty good if you want it, take a look at it, 
um, applications drive the whole need. And the more people need to use certain applications, the better off things are going to be. So we set out to identify what types of applications will be broadly uh, needed in the state and what will be essential looking forward. And Margaret touched on a few of those, healthcare, uh, the whole initiative about electronic government. If you want to do license tab renewals, uh, license renewals, unemployment insurance registration, in order to save money as a government, you have to move to the electronic version and shut off the other version. Otherwise, you have two forms that you're paying for. And actually, in the transition years, you have two forms. But ultimately, we're going to do all these things electronically. But in order for us to be able to do that, we need to know that everybody can get to the electronic version and not just have to drive down to the, to the library. The other piece that I'll mention here is that um, you know, I think the broadband piece has a lot to do with the transportation system in general when you think about it. So if you cast the transportation system as roads, airways, bicycle paths, walking paths, railroads, waterways, very broadly, in, in the past, not too many goods and services moved through electronic means. But in the future, and currently, quite a few do, and more and more will. And if we can take things that off the highway, particularly at peak time, and move them through um, a broadband mechanism, then it's going to be much more efficient, better for the environment, and better about having to build highways for peaks. So there's something to be thought of, and you're like, oh, what's that? How do you think about it? Well, think about a book. Think about a book. So let's say you order it from Amazon today. You order it, and you want a hard copy book. You order it. You get online, you order it, it goes from their warehouse to a truck, to a plane, to a truck, to your house. Um, electronic books come right to your house. There is no transportation need for that. So it's an interesting phenomenon. It has pluses and minuses, but you know when you think about what's going on with the transportation system and the needs, um, the peak loading on them is, is, is really critical. Same with airports, the peak loads are three times a day most of the time. They're very jammed. Middle of the day, inside the banks, plenty of time to fly. Anyway, think about broadband as a transportation system for the future. So the goals, a um, couple comments on them. Uh, it was odd at the time, people didn't want to have a goal. Um, and my apologies to my friend from AT&T, who's a great customer, and we are a great customer to them, but the providers fought against goals um, while investing toward getting to goals of their own, which were more significant than the goals we put in legislation. It, it was kind of counterintuitive to us, to me, as a business person, setting a goal that's aggressive actually gives them more business, but they were worried about it being an unfunded mandate, and I don't blame them for that. It didn't turn out to be that way, but then the other part that people said is, hey, if you're going to set goals up there and you're not going to fund it, what good is it? What good is it to have goals? And you know, I think they were giving up on something that's really important in government, and that is you have the pulpit. You have the attention of people. If you think from a policy matter, even without the money, that you can set some broad goals for people, and it's amazing how those things can, can be met. Some cases, maybe not met. But it's interesting, and I think we should not give up the fact that leadership, direction, and vision is an important part of setting the goals. So the goals were hard fought, and they were, they were, they were twofold. One was, uh, as mentioned, the speed. Um, we in the task force said 10 to 20 um, uh, down and 5 to 10 up. Uh, there were people on our task force who came in and said they wanted 1 gigabit. And it was not crazy. Um, from a technology point of view, which is my world, I'm like, that's where we're going to go. And yet, we didn't have a consensus around that. So we went to the highest possible speed we could that would accommodate the applications that we thought would become 
usable in the time frame. And most of that had to do with video. We were thinking of healthcare, thinking of education, um, we were thinking about electronic government, we were thinking about things that would use video. And we knew that 10 megabits was the minimum to have good video coverage, so that's where we landed. Now, I said to the group at the end, even though proudly that we arrived at a goal, you know, we're gonna look back on this goal as we get toward 2015, which is the deadline, and go, that was a ridiculously low number. I mean, CenturyLink just announced a gigabit service in various parts of the Twin Cities. AT&T's been doing that, there was an announcement just recently, I maybe even this morning, talking about their build out in some of the areas that Google had already built out gigabit speed, so that's happening. Comcast, two years ago, I think, was offering 106 megabit up, which I'm a taker of, and I think I get 140. It's just gonna go on demand, and that's, that's an interesting phenomenon, but people would not agree to go with a more significant call, so we did the best we could on that. But nevertheless, getting it passed in, 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 uh, in statute I think is a pretty amazing thing. So there was a lot, a lot to be said about that. Um, the other part of the goal that was important, we were trying to compare ourselves to um, the rest of the country and indeed also the world in terms of overall speed. And as you can see, where I think we've made progress here on the um, minimum speed goal and on getting more of the state covered, at the same time, we've regressed some in the overall USA ranking. And that would stand to reason because we haven't until this year dedicated any funding. The only funding that's really come in has been when President Obama passed the Stimulus Act and some of those went to a couple of government agencies. Some of our uh, counties, some of our municipalities <coughs> took advantage of that, have grants, they've been doing build-outs, those build-outs are probably ready to start producing some uh, positive soon here. Anyway, I mentioned this um, uh, th this build out in, uh, by CenturyLink. I don't want to just isolate on them, but the reason that we got very close to the 10 megabit goal was number one, we set it. Number two, um, if you want to think about it, technology, the rising tide lifted all boats. It was basically done by the, by the private sector, by upgrading the networks in the area because of the demand. A lot of that focused on the metro, and if you're around uh, Minnesota, we've got the metro in greater Minnesota, so our concern, a lot of the pockets that don't have the coverage uh, or are unserved or underserved are in greater Minnesota, and that's the focus of the money that was passed, the unserved first, that percentage. So the other thing that we knew as a task force is that mobile would actually solve some of the problem because at the time, 3G was just coming in, 4G was on the drawing board in the future, and we knew that 4G would have a speed that would also meet the goal. So when you're in a place where it's sparsely populated, mountains, lakes, tough terrain for uh, people to put in hard line of any type, that you've got the mobile networks that can, you know, where the antennas can build things out. And we've seen a lot of progress there. So then, you know, what's changed kind of looking the other way, as you said, our relative ranking dropped um, from 10 to 17. We haven't quite reached all the minimums and we still got some unconnected people. So that's sort of uh, the downer part of the whole thing. Um, so what really was talked about when we set the goals, there were people that just wanted to do the minimum speed goal only. And if you look just into the future, you knew technology was going to get you close to that low number. So we fought very hard to have a relative ranking, probably fought more time on the relative ranking and how to measure that than anything else in terms of the goals, once people agreed to the goals. And I, you know, I think when you look at them both, they, they're an accurate picture kind of, 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 of where we are. So let's talk about the economic competitiveness and uh, the Internet of Everything, IOE, Internet of Everything, is starting to be talked about. So I've talked a little bit about the commerce and how we move goods and services around. Um, we have disaster support and some other activities. So we as a company um, and other people 
need to be able to rely on operating their businesses or operating what they need personally from their home in the event they can't go to work. And if you do that, you also allow people not to get on the road during uh, commuting time. So both for business continuity, but also for personal choice and dispersing people in transit, it's a pretty good thing. And that's what we've talked about basically here. So by 2025, we've done a world report at Thomson Reuters that we publish. And you know everything is gonna be connected by that time. And I think we've gotta get much more aggressive in terms of putting the funding into getting toward things and obviously our goals are set to be uh, met by 2015 so we're going to have to consider do we want to have new goals for 2020 or 2025 and what would they be um, and the only way you can get to those things is a task force like any of the ones we have our particular one had 26 members from all around the state including uh, providers uh, residents business people labor representatives, you name it. It was the Noah's Ark of task force members. And everything we did was by consensus. There was not a single vote taken. Everything was signed off. In fact, in the back of our book is a signature page that everybody signed to say they're on board. So that consensus actually does work. Thanks. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, I can't thank you enough for just uh, what you and, and Thomas Reuters have done to advance this discussion in Minnesota. It, it, it can't be summed up in, in, in a simple thank you. I, I guess, uh, are there any questions from folks here? We do have a couple minutes for questions. I would like to just ask one of you, if that's all right. And I think wearing your, your hat as uh, CEO, uh, VP at, uh, at Thomas Reuters, how important is it uh, that Minnesota be a leader? In this. And I know that you touched upon it here, but I think that second goal that we put into statute is so important. We haven't talked a lot about it, but what does it mean to, to, to you as an employer, to you as a uh, leader in technology, and what does it mean to your employees? And what does it mean to our state in terms of how we rank and, and market ourselves next to other states in other areas of the world? And I, I know that you just touched on that, but I think it's so important for us sure. to hammer that home. Happy to help, Senator. Um, you know, we're, we're a proud. Uh, member of Margaret's Association and one of the things that we spend a lot of time in our organizations doing, our company, her organization, is trying to keep uh, Minnesota vibrant in terms of high tech. Uh, high tech jobs are high paying jobs or well educated jobs for the people that come in are concerned about education, they have higher incomes, they're good jobs. We want those people to come in, they value the things that we value in this state. It's very important to grow those jobs, to retain those jobs and grow those jobs. So from a private sector point of view, I've got uh, a, a large contingent of, of people here, almost 7,000 people in, in Egan. We've got a large chunk of those that are technology people. We want to have those people that we recruit join into not only a work environment that's high tech, but into communities that are high tech. Because when we're asking them to move from the coasts and come here and perhaps start a career or mid-career by prying them out of some place, we need to show them that the goods and services and amenities that they would expect are here. And, it, and in fact, take that plus a less hassled life, and that's what converts them to being here. But to do that, we need to have a lot of the things we have that have nothing to do with technology, like cultural activities, sports activities and all those things, outdoor activities, we've got that in abundance. What we need to do is make sure we've got a really vibrant, high-tech culture because they want to know that I'm not going to some oasis in the Midwest where this is the only place that I can work and if I decide I don't like it, I've got no alternatives. And guess what? We're not that way, but we're not that way because we work hard at it. We've got to build uh, the folks there and the broadband is like the circulatory system underneath it, being able to do all of those things. And even into sports and, and into culture. I mean, people complain so much when they go to Target Field and the Wi-Fi is too slow. Because they're taking pictures and sending them to other people during a baseball game. So those worlds even converge. So the importance is jobs, good jobs, high paying jobs, you know, relatively speaking, people that drive, uh, you know, that purchase things, that expect 
the things that we want in our community, like good education, good libraries, cultural activities, and so forth. Well, thanks, Rick. I really appreciate that. And I, just uh, Rick and Margaret, again, you know, I've, I've taken pages out of your playbooks that are your task force reports. So thanks again for your incredible work in, in the past years. I guess uh, just in the interest of moving along with our agenda, we can uh, can do our final speaker, Dan McKenzie, who is the executive director of Minnesota's Office of Broadband Development. Dan has over 18 years of experience with broadband issues in rural Minnesota. She was the director for technology for Cook County for 15 years and was the administrator for the Broadband Commission, bringing fiber to the home services to Cook County in northern Minnesota. Dan also was a member of the, uh, Governor Dayton's Task Force on Broadband, which was created in 2011, again, uh, to increase broadband access in Minnesota. Dan, thanks for joining us today. Good morning. Um, thank you, Senator Schmidt, for, for allowing me to help tell the Minnesota broadband story. Um, and it's interesting, we did not compare, compare note, detailed notes on what each other was going to say, but the uh, number of similar notes that are included in all three of these presentations is, uh, is stunningly similar. Um, and along those lines, we were just talking about um, Minnesota's desire to, to be uh, rank high both nationally and internationally. On the, in the subject area, the, the opening graphic I have here, for those of you who aren't from Minnesota, has a couple of significances. Number one, uh, as you see, I'm going to talk a little bit about the view from my seat in the Office of Broadband Development, and which actually is located in the building underneath this red one. So, so that's one reason why that this is uh, a significant, but obviously the more important one is, is that we are really striving to lead on this issue and see real, real benefits for um, for keeping our eye on that prize. And um, so it is well known as, Rick actually uh, was able to mention as well, one of the things um, is well known both from the business community and more recently with both state and federal government is that the level that broadband communication systems parallels our transportations transportation and utility infrastructures in many way in their importance in the viability of our economic, healthcare, education, government, and social systems. Using that frame to think about this issue provides us a familiar context for building the state's response to these gaps we've identified and we've started to talk about a little bit today. And again, part of my um, reason to be here is to highlight the value of the state's role in bending the curve to achieve those desired results. As you heard earlier, I think in both presentations, over 20% of our state's households still do not have access to what we define as a moderate level of broadband service. And I think Rick did a good job of explaining that, that, that Minnesota was able to identify in legislation that we define a moderate level of access at 10 megabits down and five megabits up, which has been um, one of Rick's most significant contributions to this, to this process. He, he created, he helped create a backboard that we have all been bouncing off since the time that that was put into place. And it's really an important element that I would, others considering going, going down this path might wanna put that on their list of things to consider. Not only do we have uh, a disparity as far as 20% uh, of the households who don't have ASCA access, but we also have some significant disparities among uh, low-income Hisp Hispanic and senior populations and their ability to access the benefits of these tools, in part due to, to issues such as digital literacy, affordability, and the knowledge of what's actually available and how they might benefit. Each state has a unique combination of assets, challenges, political, and procedural environments as it relates to broadband availability and use within its borders, and therefore has developed different approaches to addressing these issues. Margaret and Rick both talked about some of the steps Minnesota has taken towards a coordinated response to these challenges, and one of these steps has been to create the Office of Broadband Development within the Department of Employment and Economic Development, or DEED. The deliberate act of placing this effort within DEED has given us a lens that focuses our work by using a vocabulary that is already familiar and well understood by legislators and policymakers, which is that of economic and workforce development. By no means does this new frame minimize the importance of the issue to our schools, our libraries, our healthcare providers, but it does mean we need to be mindful of keeping our eye on those unique needs and issues as we move along. My role since January when I came on board has been to establish the office as a central point of contact on broadband issues. 
and to, pro and to prepare for executing the policies and programs that are passed to us from the legislature and the governor's office. During these early stages, the work has largely centered on providing information and building relationships. The world of broadband is constantly changing. This goes for changing applications and needs of the users, as Rick talked about, to the technologies used to deliver the service, to the resources available to make it all happen. At the broadband office, we monitor and decipher what's happening with the federal broadband policies and programs. We track what is happening in other states for best practices and to identify potential role models. And we also measure what's happening here in our own state. We use all of this information to help inform the discussions that are happening at all levels, including the broadband task force, between our local legislators, and within our governor's office. We also use this information when working with community groups and providers who are seeking ways to secure broadband improvements within their areas of interest. We consider ourselves bridge builders and silo creepers. We place a high value on communication and engagement activities. This complex nationwide infrastructure challenge is too big of a lift not to have all of the potential players at the table. No single entity or sector can do it all. Our role is to recognize the importance of all of those voices in the choir and to identify where the state can uniquely contribute to the team effort in achieving a leadership position in this access and application challenge that we've set for ourselves. Here's a map of, uh, of some of the disparities that in, in Minnesota's situation, those, those uh, red counties are those counties that have less than 50% of their households with access at, at that moderate speed level or of, of the 10 down, 5 up. And as has been already mentioned, one of the uh, significant accomplishments of the last session was the establishment of the Border to Border Broadband Incentive Fund with which everyone up here in this stage was pivotally involved in making happening, happen. The legislator and governor allocated $20 million for a one-time competitive grant program to help close the gap in financing broadband deployments into areas where traditional models have not been able to meet the need. We've been working over the last few months to build the program and plan to open the application process in just a couple of short weeks and, make, and hopefully make awards by the end of the year, and we are excited about that. We use it might be interesting to know we use a couple of tools when forming our expectations about that program. One was a budget, the budgetary estimate that, that Margaret talked about earlier, uh, done for the, ta the task force a couple of years ago, which estimated the cost to achieve that state goal between $900 million and $3.2 billion. Obviously, the entire amount is not a public lift, but it does give policymakers a decent sense of the size and scope of the challenge and where the state's efforts might fit in within that spectrum. The second tool we used was a list of the letters of interest that were submitted to the FCC for their Rural Broadband Experiments Program. Minnesota entities sent in more than 60 letters of interest, more than any other state in the country. Letters came from small providers, large providers, co-ops, city and county governments, along with a few formal and informal community-based efforts. The value of the project submitted was over $600 million. At the most, Minnesota might see one of these projects funded through that federal program. These two pieces of information can be used to make some informed predictions about what we might see come out of the Minnesota's competitive grant process this fall and how much additional need may exist after this funding is exhausted. One of the meaningful things that's already come out of this program is the engagement of Minnesota's terrific provider community. They are stepping up and they're asking the right questions about how we might work together to make Minnesota a national leader in this space and provide the necessary tools for our communities, our businesses, and our institutions to thrive in today's economy. Suffice it to say, we're optimistic that, we'll be, that we will be kept very busy this fall and have opportunity to fund many worthwhile projects in this program. And it might be helpful to know, I view this, import, this as an important pilot program. It is my job not only to successfully deploy these one-time funds in the most impactful way possible, but it's also to do it in such a way that we produce the knowledge and understanding needed for legislators and policymakers to make informed decisions going forward about the best means for the state to achieve its broadband goals. While we have focused almost exclusively on the grant program, I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's the only task at hand. I often refer to our work through the lens of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, mostly because we have a lot of different stakeholders who think we should be working on a lot of different things and they need to help focus, get, 
people to understand how we're focusing our limited time and energy. Uh, and obviously during these initial stages we are focusing on the more majority of our efforts on getting access out to those areas and individuals that currently don't have it. In addition to the grant program, examples of other tasks we've been charged with include looking at Minnesota's public asset management strategies for opportunities to re remove barriers or incent infrastructure development, particularly into the areas of the state with lower, lower levels of access. This includes things like Dig One's policies, rights of way management issues such as permitting, and access to other publicly owned assets like communications towers. Monitoring opportunities that may come out of FirstNet also fits into this bucket of our work. Very closely following the access issue is looking at where we're at as a state with having the skills and knowledge to use this access to realize the benefits that come from applying the tools that are available. We're beginning to look at ways the state can play a role both for individual digital literacy barriers as well as the capacity building of our small businesses where it's been demonstrated and shown to in increase in profitability and growth by those businesses who use these tools effectively. As we get these basic balls rolling down the hill, we'll be able to spend more of our time on broadband self-actualization <laughs> efforts, as I call it. Uh, through fostering of advanced network development, improving the, the IP infrastructure ecosystem in Minnesota, and supporting advanced workforce development efforts so that we become a more attractive place for outside investors to build and grow their network and communications intensive businesses. Supporting digital government services also falls into this category as an area where the state can benefit by starting to consolidate service delivery modes, as Rick mentioned as well as contribute to making the network more useful by providing relevant ways for citizens to access their government using online tools. And as a final point, they asked each of us, kind of beyond the, the, um, the, the pyramid concept, they asked each of us to weigh in a little bit about state policy recommendations. Well, my role on this team is one of carrying balls forward after after the task force, the legislature, and the governor throw them over the fence. And, however, I am probably the person most well positioned to see the positive impacts that are being made by the less glamorous aspects of the state's investment in this issue. I think everyone you've heard from this morning would attest to the value of having an office in place to serve the information needs of those working on broadband access and use and has made positive difference in the state and how the state engages in this issue. Dare I say that even some former naysayers would also agree with this statement. So while I'm fully aware that it sounds self-serving coming from me, my recommendations to policymakers would include the, the continuation of operational and program support for the office and the work we do to connect information and resources with the folks who are doing the real work in solving these problems. This same recommendation holds true for continuing the state's investments in broadband mapping and data analysis. The federal pro program that, be that began this effort sunsets at the end of this year. Minnesota has set broadband goals that are ambitious and will yield great returns once they are achieved. But as we all know, what gets measured is what gets done. Continuing the support of information is critical to informing our next steps towards these goals. In closing, I'd just like to reiterate a couple of points. There is real value in Minnesota pursuing a leadership position in this arena. Not only does our state have natural assets that make it an attractive place for this type of economic development, but we also place a high value on the health and well-being of all areas of our state. By keeping our eye on the broadband ball, we're actively supporting both an important economic development opportunity as well as an important community value. Secondly, the investments Minnesota has made so far are starting to pay off. Positive change is happening. Real optimism is building, both with providers and with communities, that Minnesota is making steps in the right direction towards achieving its goals. And finally, as has been talked about up here already, this is a team effort. Every person on this stage and many others who are not here today, along with the legislators in this room from Minnesota, has played a role in building this positive momentum. And I very much look forward to the opportunity to continue to work on that effort in the coming session. And then finally, ironically, uh, with Rick's reference to Wi-Fi in the ballpark, I have been told by some folks that uh, this is actually a better representation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> and this is another reason we should be keeping our eye on that ball. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.
much, Dan, and thank you, panelists. This has been a great discussion so far. Just want to tell audience members, we do have, uh, I'm going to be generous and say almost 10 minutes for Q&A, so if folks have any, please uh, feel free to step up to the mic. Um, I'll, I'll just say one real quick question here, if I could, of you, Dana. Um, you have a unique perspective, having been a practitioner uh, for a number of years, and I'm wondering if you could just reiterate the importance of having an office or some kind of concerted effort, a, a one-stop shop, a clearinghouse, to helping local communities take that next step, and whether it's in partnership with providers or, or providers with resources, whatever it might be. How, this is your chance to say why the Office of Broadband Development is so important and what promise it holds. And I'm just curious if you could just, you know, from that perspective, say a little bit more. I, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I guess I can speak to one, one particular segment of that need sure. jumps to mind, and that is we are at the stage of the game where the connectivity piece of this is largely a rural issue. And it's a challenging issue to talk about here in St. Paul, where all of us have the access that we need, and most of us have the skills we need to find what we need and to, to actually realize those benefits. So, the, so having a place in St. Paul that's dedicated to, to telling that story that's difficult to see if you're not out there experiencing it, I think is one of the significant values of the office. Thank you. I think we have a few questions. So, sir, if you don't mind uh, stating your name and where you're from. Uh, thank you. Max Tyler from uh, Colorado. And we're working on the same thing you are. And I have a couple questions. One of them is technical, and the other one is uh, not. Uh, the technical question is how do you know what your speeds are in the rural areas? Uh, you know, there are reported speeds, there are marketing speeds, and there's crowdsourcing. So, we find crowdsourcing may be a lot different than uh, what the advertised speeds are. So, how do you know your speeds? And the other one is if you're looking at areas with uh, market failure, uh, are you looking at the possibilities of counties doing their own build out and doing their own broadband setup if the private sector is not doing that? I can take the, the known speeds. Uh, the, uh, we actually work with the provider, um, Connect Minnesota, that, that is in communication with all 128 broadband providers in the state. And on a six month, so every six months, they update their database of their coverage areas and their advertised speeds. As part of that process, we, we send uh, a, a technician out into the field to validate all of those claims. And so they will connect to the network, they will go see where the DSLANs are and, 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 and distance from a central office as far as claimed DSL speeds, those sorts of things. While it's not perfect, they can get into every system. It really does a, a decent job of validating the data that we're getting back from providers. And on the second question, one of the uh, design implementation uh, beauties of the program we put in place is that there are extra bonus points in the process for people who come together from different perspectives. So a county could come together with a provider to make the proposal for the $20 million fund for a, a grant towards it. And, and the scoring system is going to you know, pop that up higher in its scoring system. There is a way in the state of Minnesota for local communities to build out uh, systems on their own. There are some issues with the way that happens under the current law in terms of ease of use. Uh, there's sort of a supermajority referendum needed to do that. And so the task force has done some looking at modernization of that telecommunications law and did make a recommendation that the legislature, and this is where we know our boundary, okay? So as a task force, a volunteer task force with everyone sitting at the table, to get to consensus on exactly what that policy is, is harder for us. But what we did do in our last two reports is highlight the need for the relevant committees in the legislature to do a telecom modernization review, and that's likely one of the issues that would come up in that. And it did come up a little bit this year, but they couldn't get to consensus on it in a shorter year of the legislative session. But I think the big thing in, in policy design of this is that we wanted to say that your proposal will be viewed by those judging it and scoring it as higher if there's public-private partnership baked right into it. Any other questions from folks? Yeah, please. And again, if you could state your name and, uh, and where you're from. Good morning. 
Dan Nelson from Midcontinent Communications. We're a broadband provider in Minnesota, uh, uh, greater Minnesota, not in the metro, uh, North Dakota and South Dakota. My question for each of the panelists is if miraculously all the resources were suddenly available to, uh, as defined, solve this problem, what would be the balance that you would strike between access and adoption? We've touched on both of them today, but what's your, just with your personal experience, what's your internal gyroscope tell you is the, is the balance that needs to be achieved between getting people access and then getting them to use the access once they have it? Well, we, we hear this from the providers all the time, that, that in some areas where there actually is access to the high-speed broadband, the take rate is not as, as robust as it needs to be to do that return on investment. And so one of the other portions, and we actually expanded this role for the task force, I'll be honest, we sort of decided to become takers on this one, and we said we would focus on adoption. And we would provide resources about, uh, you know, I think we created a website, Why Broadband, to help individuals around the state understand the usefulness. Now, there is a natural uh, demographic to some of this, I will say. And that is that we see that consumers, potential consumers over the age of 65 or so, are less likely to take the broadband product. Um, not exclusive, we have plenty of people out there who are doing a lot using broadband who are in that category, but we also know that with uh, more digital natives and the desire that in some ways we have two things happening. We need to continue to do education. Applications, like Rick said, are driving this. I mean, the more that happens online, the more that people say, I'm gonna fill out that federal student aid uh, online. I'm going to sign up for our version of the ACA online, Minsure. Then they are going to demand and also need to connect. But we do work on both of these things and the office actually does have that as a piece of its goal. So I don't know about what's the right balance, but we certainly also know that as the awareness grows around the state that connection may be coming people talk to each other about what it means. And businesses in particular, you know, I always use this, that, that you don't have to sell online to see the benefit of having a website. It doesn't have to be a selling website to see that benefit. And that's because, you know, when I'm driving in southwestern Minnesota and I wanna know, well, what's in this town? Or, you know, I happen to be kind of, I don't look in my basement, I collect both fabric and someday we'll sew it. Um, you know, I stop at every uh, fabric shop and quilt shop in the state. I don't need to buy from that place, but boy, I need to know what their hours are. So telling these stories one-to-one -one as we go around the state has been important. Just if I had to put a number on it, I'd say 20 to 25% of the money should be spent on um, helping educate people about the potential. Some, some number like that. I, I quite agree with the points. It's interesting because um, I, I, I think age alone is not a factor. If you're, if you're an 82 year old great grandmother, you may think this has nothing to, to do for you. But actually, if you have an iPad and you use the photo stream, you can have pictures of your great grandchildren every single day of your life, even if they live a thousand miles away. Now, that may seem, that's not, a, that's a non-critical thing, but it's a very important thing to uh, people. And people, if they realize what they're passing up, add up a couple of those things that are real life human things, throw in some e-government, throw in some health care, pretty soon you have a reason to take the, you know, increase the take rate, and the take rate will go up. What we want to do is have the infrastructure support an increased take rate, and have the infrastructure support these good applications so that then it happens. So they kind of all got to move up a little bit together, I think. Yeah. Any final thoughts? I would just reiterate okay. Rick's, Rich, Rick's comment that it's a three legged stool and we really need to be working on all three access, uh, use, and um, digital literacy. Uh, and, and, and every day that mix is going to probably look a little bit different. 
Thank you. If there aren't any uh, further thoughts from our panel here today, any questions uh, in the audience, I guess I'd just like to, I guess, thank our panelists for what I, I view as a very rich discussion today. There's so many analogies with uh, with broadband, the three-legged stool. We talk about access and adoption and, and, and utilization. We also talk about, you know, in, uh, internet access being the interstate highway of the 21st century, uh, and also the fact that this is not. Uh, unlike the, the call for action for rural electrification a century ago. It took to galvanized efforts to, to make a difference, to move that dial. And it's so important that we, we set goals, that we, we follow through with them, and that we continue to drive Minnesota forward. And with that said, I'm proud of our efforts here in Minnesota, and uh, I hope that uh, efforts similar in other states will continue to move forward. And, uh, and again, I hope we can continue this conversation, not only here, but uh, in other states as well. So with that said, thank you again for being part of this discussion today. And uh, I think we'll all stick around for a little while afterwards. Thank you.